Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to everybody in the room. Welcome to all of you online. That's better. There you go. Um, it is my great privilege to introduce Rich Napoli, who is CEO of Object Frontier. This is a 1,200-person software company um, that has the amazing privilege. So th those of you that follow startups, you know that Inc. Magazine is the gold standard. They track every other fastest growing companies. While Rich has been CEO, Object Frontier has been on Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing companies, not once, not twice, but three years in a row. A total of 1,200% growth over the time he's been in CEO, which is truly, truly amazing. Um, even though he was trying to play it down, it is truly amazing. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so Rich has over 40 years of experience in software. He did his undergrad in computer science um, at Stony Brook. No. Stony Brook. Yeah, yeah Stony Brook. Yep. Got it. Okay, good. An MBA from NYU. Uh, he's been married 39 years, has three kids, all of whom had the great intelligence to graduate from Catholic University. Uh, he's got six grandkids. I'm expecting them all to come here as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. Um, so please, uh, our, and most importantly, I think, um, Rich is also a deacon in the Catholic Church, and you'll hear more about that story as well. And so please give a warm Bush School welcome to Mr. Rich Napoli. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be back here. You know, I, I, Dr. Bella said all three of my kids graduated from here, the last one in 2012, so... It's been that long since I've been on campus, and wow, it has changed a lot for the better, and you guys are going to have a great time here. I think you're all freshmen, is that right, pretty much? No? You're all freshmen. You're all freshmen. Oh, you guys. All right. Anyway, well, then you know that it's a great school. So, but, uh, and thanks for having me here, Dr. Bell. So, I'm going to talk to you about a few things, but you know, I want to start off with uh, sort of a little analogy here. You all came by car some way you all know, been in the cars somehow some way i came by car and cars are incredible pieces of technology right they have thousands of moving parts millions of lines of software inside and yet we don't really care right we just put gas in the car you know turn the key press the button whatever it is and off we go and it's incredible and it's incredible how simple it is to drive compared to the complexity that's in it for me, it's a little different. I'm a big car guy. I uh, subscribe to five different car magazines. I have uh, um, been to uh, Grand Prix races in Montreal. I've been, uh, you know, at racing on a track. I've been judges at uh, car, classic car shows. I've run classic car shows. So for me, it's a little bit more. Cars are a little bit more than that. But even with that, it's still like. I, just, I love driving them, I love being around them, but I don't really have to worry too much about how it works. Cars, even for me, as a car enthusiast, you just kind of turn on and, and enjoy it. So, you know, the inside of a car, the engine of a car, not so interesting. Until I read about this. Anybody know what this is a model of? Well, don't worry if you don't. <laughs> I didn't either. This is what's called a crankshaft. It's a, it's a part of an engine that uh, it kind of rotates like this and it makes the pistons go up and down. Who cares? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamental part of a car, but not particularly interesting. And yet the car magazines I was reading back in 2016 were all raving about this particular kind of crankshaft, which is called a flat plane crankshaft. Never heard of it. Um, and it has to do with the way these pins are all lined up in a, in a flat plane. Okay, not really particularly important, but the car magazines were going on and on and on because there was a new American car <clears throat> that had this. And there's a, prior to that, there were only kinds of cars that had flat plane crankshaft were race cars and Ferraris. So this American car was getting all kinds of attention. I'm like, all right, I guess, you know, I'm a judge at car shows. I, I kind of got to know what I'm talking about. So let me look into what this is all about. And so I started reading about this technology and, and I started reading it more and more, and the more I read, the more excited I got about it. And you know, without going into a lot of details, it's it's uh, because of the design of this crankshaft, the engine can rev faster, uh, higher speed, uh, they manage exhaust gas, yada yada yada. It's not important, but the point is that it's the car. It's called a Shelby GT350. 
won all kinds of awards. It won Car of the Year Award, it won uh, uh, on the 10 best list of the award. And then it made the list of the 25 greatest cars of all time. And then because of that, it's also on my driver's side. <laughs> so my point is, you know, I, I mean, I, it's a great car. I mean, I drive it everywhere. I've driven to Canada, I drive it to Manhattan all the time. I drive it down here, it's my daily driver. I go everywhere and I love it. It's a, it's a joy to drive. It sounds fantastic. Five plane crankshaft to make a different engine sound than regular cars. Um, so, and it's actually parked outside. If any of you want to see it uh, later on, I brought it with me. So why do I tell you all this? I mean, this is not a shop class. So uh, actually, the, you know, I'll tell you one thing. This, they give you this when you buy the car. Because, because it's actually that significant to the car. Anyway, so why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because it's an example of several things in my life that I didn't think were particularly interesting, I didn't think were particularly relevant, didn't believe in that that was important. And yet, as I learned about it, as I dove in and understood it more, I came to realize, like, wow, this is really significant. And so I'm going to talk about two other examples of that. Uh, one is blockchain. Uh, and, and why blockchain? Because Dr. Bella said I had to talk about blockchain. Uh, it's a, um, and then we'll get on to the other one. But blockchain, um, has been described as one of the, the most significant uh, digital technologies since the invention of the internet. So pretty big drama there, right? Um, and he knows that I uh, am involved with blockchain with my company. I, I, I co-host a radio show on blockchain.radio. It's a 24 seven global radio station that just talks about blockchain, believe it or not. And for me, as Dr. Bell said, I've been in the software business for 40 years, over 40 years, and uh, I wrote my first software program in 1972 in high school. So I've seen generations of technology come and go. I was, this is before, you know, before mobile phones, before the internet, before PCs, I go way back. So I've seen lots of technologies come and go. You can get rid of that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've seen lots of technologies come and go. And so when I first, I heard about blockchain back in 2013 or 14, something like that, some speaker was talking about it. It's the technology that powers Bitcoin. So how many of you have heard of Bitcoin? Yeah. It's, but Bitcoin is not blockchain. Bitcoin is built on blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying technology. Bitcoin is an, an application built on top of blockchain. Uh, and, but I heard about it and I'm like, same thing. I was like, well, you know, I am a, I am a CEO of a software company kind of got to know what I'm talking about. I have to at least, at least be able to say a couple of words about what this blockchain technology is. And so I started to, to look at it. So what, what is blockchain? Um, it sounds, Jeff, it sounds incredibly boring. It sounds, you know, it's like a, like a deep in the bowels kind of technology. And it is for the most part, just like you don't really worry about how the internet works. Eventually one day you won't have to worry about how blockchain works. But right now, it's, it's new technology, but it's fundamentally it sounds pretty boring. It's just a, and it's elemental, it's a, it's a database. It's electronic storage of information. It's your spreadsheet does the same thing. Your text messages do the same thing. It just is at its essence is nothing all that different. And yet it is, has dramatic implications. So we're gonna talk a few minutes about that. Again, same kind of thing. I didn't understand it, didn't want to really understand it. But as I started to go into it, I saw that, wow, this is really significant technology. And I started to get, I became this, you know, evangelist for it as well. So let me use an analogy. I'm going to pull up here with Bill's help. And it's an analogy, I'm passing it as a uh, cheap shall we analogy. Uh, so while he's setting it up, you all have seen uh, a tree stump, right? Or a tree carved, you know, cut in half. And you've all seen rings like that. Um, and if you know, if you remember in your biology class, whatever, what the rings stand for, each ring represents one year of growth of the tree, right? If you notice, you can see some rings are pretty close to each other. And that typically means that it was a dry year for the tree didn't grow that much. Some rings are quite far apart. That means it was a very wet year, lots of sunshine, so the tree grew a lot, right? And you can also see um, maybe the one year there was a forest fire. And the tree caught fire, so the bark, you know, got burned. So the point is that tree, that, that view of the tree holds a complete record of that tree's life. Not only that tree's life, but probably all the trees around it, right? So I'm going to use this as an analogy to explain 
introduce some principles that are in blockchain and then we'll apply them to blockchain. So first is it's in the, in the blockchain world we call it, it's immutable, meaning I can't go back and change what happened to the tree. I can't go in and carve out one of the rings and just take it out, right? It's, it's baked in there, it's, it's unalterable, it's immutable, I cannot change it. So that's one thing, um, you know, not even Mother Nature can change it, right? It, it's locked in. Secondly, it's um, transparent, meaning that every one of us who, who walk by the tree, sort of we have privilege to see the tree, we all see the same thing. We can all see how many years it was around, what happened each year, it's visible to all of us. It's distributed, that's a little bit of a stretch in this analogy, but you know, if, if this tree said it was in a forest and there were several other trees around it, right around it, if you cut any of those trees down, let's, let's assume they were all planted at the same time. If you cut any of those trees down, they would all pretty much have the same representation. They would all have the same lean years, they'd all have the same thick years, they'd all have the same fire. So the, so the record of that fire, or the record of that forest, I'm sorry, is distributed amongst all the trees. All the trees have a copy of, of what that record represents, right? It's secure, that's another thing to talk about in blockchain. It's secure meaning only Mother Nature is authorized <laughs> to write to this, right? Only Mother Nature can add to it. She can add another ring around it. No one else has the authority, no one else is authorized to update that, that, uh, that, uh, that database, if you will, a database of you know, what happened in the forest. And finally, it's, it's what I would say is it's a ledger. Now, you guys are all grad students, you've all been through your accounting classes. Remember your ledger days, you know, debits and credits and write, well, you probably don't even do that anymore, but <laughs> you write them down. I hated accounting class. Uh, you write them down uh, and, you know, every deposit, every withdrawal and, and so on, movement from one account to the other. And, there, and you just kept adding to the bottom of it. And if you made a mistake, you could go back and change the record up here, the entry up here, because then you would have had to change all the ones below it. You just make a correcting entry at the bottom. Same kind of thing here is even Mother Nature can only write at the end. She can't change anything inside. She can add another ring at the end, but she can't change what's in there. So it's a notion of a ledger, it's just added to at the end. Okay, so what now let's apply those to blockchain. Let me keep this up there for a minute. Um, so for blockchain, I'm gonna give you sort of the definition, at least my definition, and then we'll try to unpack that statement. Blockchain is an immutable, transparent, distributed, secure ledger of data records that are updated by agreement among interested parties. So let's unpack all that. So first it's a ledger, meaning it's just like what I talked about, just like your accounting ledger. It's a, it's a file of data where you can only append to it at the end of it. Okay, all right, not so, not so important by itself. It's secure, meaning that only authorized people are allowed to write to it. And there's and all kinds of different types of blockchains. We're not going to go into public versus private blockchain. There's all different kinds of blockchains, all different kinds of authorization procedures, all using cryptography to make sure that the person that's authorized to do that and only that person can do that. It's distributed, meaning unlike most databases, there's not a central database. There isn't one place that you go to, one server that all that data is on. Everybody that's interested in that data has a copy of of that of that data and if anybody updates one of them it's replicated to everybody everybody gets instantly updated and we'll come by and come back to why that's important i just want to give you a background then we'll talk more importantly about the uses of it it's transparent meaning that <coughs> anybody that's authorized can see the whole history of transactions you can see the entire ledger all the entries and finally it's immutable and this is probably the most interesting part of blockchain um, again because of cryptography um, I'm not going to go into all hashing and uh, hashing algorithms and things like that, but it's it, the idea is that once the record is agreed upon amongst all the parties and written out to the ledger, you can't go back and change it. Now, technically, you couldn't physically change it, but once you changed it, it the way that the hashing works is if you change an earlier entry, it has a ripple effect and it changes all the other entries after it. So everybody on the network that had consensus uh, would say that's not a good, that's not a valid entry, and they would all and they would unplug it. Okay, so that's what it is. But now let's talk about why. Why, why is it so um, uh, important? I'll give you an example, and you guys are pretty young, you may not have to worry about this yet, but uh, 
as old guys do. Uh, so every time you go to a doctor, a new doctor, what do you have to do? You have to sit in the, in the waiting room and fill out multiple pages of every test you've ever had, every surgery you ever had, every uh, treatment you ever had, every diagnosis, every medicine. When you're 18 or 20 years old, it's not so hard to remember. When you're 64, I, can, I, I can't remember all that stuff. And, and chances are, the stuff I'm going to forget might be important to the doctor to remember, to diagnose me. So now imagine that you could have uh, a, a record of your, all your medical history from the moment you were born until, your, until the end of everything I just said, every procedure, every test, every medicine, every diagnosis, all throughout your life, secure so that only you could see it and whoever you told gave the authorization to see it. So your doctor, for example, could see it. But even he or she could only append to the end of it. They could add new records, but they couldn't go back and change your earlier, earlier history. Right? And you would control it, and you would, and no matter where you went in the world, your complete record would be available to you and whoever you authorized it to. That's an example of, of, of what blockchain can do, but it's not just a healthcare thing. It's in every industry has potential for this. Give you another example. Um, I'm guessing most of you are not, uh, I think some of you are uh, homeowners and landowners, um, but your parents might remember when you go to buy a house, you have to, how do you know that the person that's selling you the house really owns the house? Well, you have to hire a middleman. You have to hire a title insurance agent. And what does that agent do? They go and go to the local tax records and you know, the municipal tax authorities and you know, your state authorities and look up the history of that plot of land all the way back to, you know, like the 1600s to make sure that the ownership of that land was defined and it's been properly transmitted all through the generations and there's no mortgages or liens or tax uh, due on any of that history so that when you go to buy it, you know you're getting ownership of that land and that house. Um, again, imagine, and this is happening now, where those titles are now stored on an immutable, secure, distributed ledger that everybody can see the history of that piece of property from the, you know, the time America was founded till, till today. You wouldn't need that title insurance agent, theoretically, um, because there's now what we call digitized trust. Now, because you know that this is immutable, you know it's, uh, it's secure, you can look at the record yourself and you can see if the house is in the clear. You can buy the uh, insurance, uh, the house being clear. That's another example. Um, I'm just going to list a few others. Tracking high value goods, uh, cars, uh, working with a, a, a mint, uh, tracking bullion bars, uh, things that have high value where you want to make sure that you've tracked it, it didn't get lost. And more important, in the case of gold, you want to make sure it's been ethically mined and that the gold has been ethically sourced. There's a whole chain of custody that you can use blockchain for. Lots of different parties, each one recording. A better example, perhaps, is in food, food management. Um, a couple of years ago, Walmart had a big issue with, and all the farmers had an issue with uh, romaine lettuce, where it was tainted lettuce. And they didn't really know which lettuce was affected, so they had to pull the entire uh, uh, inventory of, of lettuce off the shelves. Well, they've now implemented that. Walmart has taken a big club to their vendors and said, you must use blockchain. And now they track from the time the farmer, go from farm to fork, from the time the farmer puts it in the crate, scans it, to the time it goes on the truck. There's the sensors on the truck to make sure it's been uh, temperature controlled. They can tell how long it's been in the truck. When it gets off the truck, it's scanned. When it gets on the shelf, it's scanned. When you buy it, it gets scanned. And now they know exactly where that box of lettuce and shelf, you know, the container of lettuce went. So if there is a problem, they can pull it all out. You, as a consumer, can look. It's transparent. You can look at the whole history. Not that it's all that interesting to look at the history of your lettuce, but then you can see all the places it's been. It hasn't been temperature controlled. Has it been sitting in a warehouse for months, right? You know, so you get uh, some insights there. But it goes on, uh, government, social security records, tax records, driver's licenses, you know, pretty much anything you can deal with the government uh, can be put online. Uh, I met the, uh, one of the ambassadors of Estonia, and Estonia is basically a digital country. All their, uh, you know, uh, citizen records are, they're in the cloud, they're being put on blockchain now, but they, they even predated blockchain. But 
The idea is that any interaction you have with Estonia as a citizen is stored on a, on a blockchain type record. You can even become Estonian citizens, as it turns out, uh, digitally. So uh, government, banking, finance, cryptocurrencies, we talked about Bitcoin, of course, uh, but you can track loan payments, mortgage payments, music, uh, digital rights management for songs. When you create your song, you want to make sure that you own it. And uh, you know, so it's recorded on the blockchain that you created this song. You actually put the song in the blockchain itself, and then you can assign it out to people and control the rights and even collect money. There's another piece of blockchain is this notion of uh, smart contracts. You can actually digitize the contract that we might agree on so that when I receive goods, you get my money automatically. Anyway, it's a huge concept. Um, it's, it's a huge concept of digitizing trust that has applicability in every industry. Um, Ginny Romanti, the former CEO of IBM, said that blockchain will do for transactions what the internet did for information. It's a huge, huge concept. As I said, you know, you go to blockchain radio, in fact, if you have an Alexa device, you can say, play blockchain radio. And a lot of it's boring, <laughs> I'll tell you that, but it is 24 hours, uh, seven days a week, because lots of people in 100 countries around the world, lots of people want to hear about it. Okay, so I guess that's, you know, a second example of something that I first thought was pretty boring, and in some ways it is still boring, it's still technology, but um, it's far more fascinating than I ever thought it would be, because I've seen so much technology hard to get excited about technology after 40 years, and yet this is so significant. So I used, I now I have two examples of things that I didn't really care about, didn't, I thought they were irrelevant, you know, uh, crankshafts and blockchain. They were irrelevant, not part of my life, not important, didn't really believe in them. And I want to talk, as, as Dr. Bell said, I am a deacon, so you're not gonna get out of here without some faith talk, right? Uh, I want to talk about the other thing I didn't think was very important in my life that I didn't particularly believe in, and that was God, right? It's, and I'm going to try to condense my story because obviously I could talk forever about that, but it's, a, it's been a heck of a journey. God's got a sense of humor, taking me from, I was an atheist for most of my life uh, until 2002. So quick recap of how that came about. Um, my mother was a devout Catholic. Um, uh, you know, went to mass all the time, every day, and some, sometimes. And uh, but my dad was a very smart guy, high Mensa, you know, Mensa member, high IQ, very logical, like a Mr. Spock almost. And just felt that you know God was a man-made construct, not really, not real, something we created because it makes us feel good, it gives us hope, keeps us in line. Uh, but kind of like Santa Claus, when you grow up, you kind of know better. Uh, and the same with God. It's just a man-made uh, concept. And for me, being like, a, you know, like most young men, you want to be like a dad, well, I was an atheist too. And uh, didn't go over too well in my high school. I went to Catholic elementary school, Catholic uh, high school. But, you know, I stuck to my guns. I'm very intellectual about it. Not, not a, you know, God didn't wrong me. I didn't have any great abuse or anything like that. I just intellectually thought it was uh, irrelevant in my life. And I felt that I was in charge of my life. Anything good that happened to me, was my, due to my successes, anything bad was due to my failures. And in one sense, it's, you know, it sounds as freeing, but it's also a burden when you're the only one responsible for that. But life was good to me. You know, I, I married my childhood sweetheart. Uh, we, we, uh, we had three kids. Uh, <clears throat> my job was doing well. A nice house up in uh, upstate New York, uh, up in New York, uh, in uh, Westchester County, up north of New York City. I'm from Queens, New York, if you haven't figured that out yet. My, uh, my uh, accent, um, and I was doing well, you know. Uh, but uh, and my dad retired, moved to moved to Florida. That's you know, from New York. It's the law. If you uh, if you uh, retire, you have to go. You have to move to Florida. So I moved down there, and I kind of missed the intellectual dialogues he and I would have because we would have these great discussions about you know the, sh the oh you need to pull this down. Sorry. Uh, uh, about the, uh, the shape of the universe, uh, the existence of God, all, you know, all kinds of wonderful topics. Uh, and he would, I, and I would just chew on for hours. And he wasn't around anymore for that. But uh, one night I'm watching TV, I'm watching uh, uh, a movie that probably way predates all of you called Oh God. Uh, it's a comedy uh, with uh, John Denver. It's about a, a young man who's having problems in life. 
and God comes down in the form of an older man to help him out. And the, the kid, the kid's not buying it, right? There's old man is God. Are you kidding me? Uh, and so finally, the, the the man says to the boy, "What do I do, have to do to convince you that I'm God?" Oh, that's, yeah, I wish my dad was here. That would be a great dialogue to have with my father and just really chew on that. What would it take? What would it take? And so I started thinking about it myself. And without taking you through all the details, there's no right answer for that, of course, right? But uh, it's like, well, it can't be some like cheap magic trick, you know. Uh, I saw David Copperfield once perform; he's amazing. But you know, it had to be something that nobody could influence easily, right? I decided maybe something in space, uh, but I didn't want to hurt anybody. I didn't want like the sun to blow up or something like that. So I somehow I concluded that maybe like an asteroid that. Went by the earth, nobody saw it, it almost hit the earth, and, and uh, they didn't see it until after it went. And uh, since I couldn't see it, the only way I would know what happened is if it was on, in, on the front page of the New York Times. So that was my Bible back then. You know, anything true was on the New York Times. And, that, and if I saw it on the New York Times, then I know it would be true. And something about it, I, it had to be three days after I thought about it, I can't remember why, but anyway, I, I went to bed that night saying, okay. That's what it would take, case closed. You know, I have to talk about it to my dad with sometime. I forgot about it until three days later. Uh, woke up in the morning, looking at my, reading my New York Times. And if you can see it. Okay. Uh, on the front page of the New York Times on that day is, this one, right there at the bottom. Big asteroid passes near Earth unseen, rare close call. I'm like, hmm. you know, you would think that that would be my aha moment, that that would be, well, there it is. I, that's what it would take for me to believe in God. He came through. I'm done. But it doesn't work that way. When you're an atheist, it can't possibly be the cause of God. It's got to be just an incredible coincidence. And so I just, you know, chewed on it for a little bit, folded up the piece of paper, and as you can tell, I didn't keep it. And I sat in my drawer for 10 years. 10 years. Life went on. Life was still good. Um, bigger house, you know, outside Philadelphia. Kids are growing up. Um, you know, life's moving forward. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. But my wife, not so much. My wife um, has cystic fibrosis. As if you know, it's a, you know, a genetic, life-threatening, life-shortening disease. And um, she was struggling at that point. She was in and out of the hospital many times. So she was coughing up lots of blood uh, and uh, it was getting more and more serious. The doctors concluded that most of it problem was on uh, one side, it was in one lung. So the doctor said, you know what? We're gonna have to take that lung out. And up until that point, and it's like nine hours of surgery, so it's a heck of, a, heck of an ordeal. Up until that point though, you know, we had, I hadn't been, you know, a practicing Catholic, although I would take my kids to church uh, with my wife uh, because I thought it was the right thing to do is just to expose them to faith. And my wife would go most times too, you know, but sometimes we just wouldn't, you know, we, we weren't like consistent, uh, regular churchgoers. And her definition of being Catholic from her parents was you went to Mass on Sunday. I mean, you went to Mass on Sunday, you know, that was all you had to do. Um, but as she was being wheeled in, she gave her prayer to God and said, all right, Lord, you know, this is it, I'm ready. But if not, I'd like, I promise to get to know you better and introduce you to my family. Because I really hadn't done a particularly good job of passing the faith on. Our kids were nominal Catholics, you know, we, we did send them to CCD and things, but not really an active part of our lives and not particularly an active part of their lives. So she goes to the surgery, nine hours of surgery, she comes out, uh, you know, remarkably well. Uh, I think there's a little side story. She comes out in there, she's in the recovery room, and you know, she's got tubes and wires and everything all over her. Uh, after nine hours of surgery, big stitches all over. And uh, she's still sort of under anesthesia, and I'm, I come up to her and I'm like, honey, honey, you okay, you okay? Without even opening her eyes, she just goes, I'm still alive to spend your money. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point I said, okay, I think she's gonna be fine. Uh, so uh, uh, she came through, uh, you know, remarkably well, and, um, and then she said, okay, Lord, what do I do? You know, you did, you did your job. How do I get to know you better? I don't even know where to start. 
Um, you know, she went to CCB a long time ago and uh, again, had no resources to turn to, didn't know where to do, but she knew she'd you know, go to mass. So we started going to mass more regularly. And one of the priests there uh, one day mentioned uh, uh, that there was a new radio station in Philadelphia, a new Catholic radio station called Holy Spirit Radio. And that maybe she'd turn it on and listen. So she did, she went out, and I swear that, that station was on like three years nonstop in our house, in the car, in the house, in the shower, with headphones on, and she's vacuuming. It was on everywhere. And she was like this dry sponge, just soaking it up. And I'm thinking as, a, as an atheist, like, oh my gosh, I'm losing her to some crazy cult. Is this Catholic cult thing? You know, it's like, uh, just because uh, uh, I, you know, she was saying all this wonderful stuff and very excited about her faith, never beating us over the head with it, but just always inviting us, saying, hey, I'm going, I'm going to Mass, I'm going to pray, I'm going to a shrine. I didn't even know what a shrine was at the time. But we're always excited. And, uh, you know, and over time, our kids began to notice, and I noticed, you know, my wife was changing. She, we're both from New York, we're both kind of that, uh, you know, that high anxiety type. Uh, and yet she was becoming more, more patient, more loving, more kind, most significantly more peaceful. It was just a peace to her that we had never noticed before. So it got me curious, and, and then she invited me to a fundraiser for the radio station to come and, um, you know, to, to, to raise some money. And I said, yeah, I think I'll go. Uh, I'd like to thank them. They did a good job on you. <laughs> and, and uh, so I went, and I'm working, it's about 300 people there, and I'm working the room like I were at a conference, right? I'm shaking hands and chatting people up. Uh, and as I'm talking to people, I realize they're all like her. They're all peaceful, loving, patient, kind people. I had never been around faith-filled people before until that, that night. Wow, this is, this is like on viral. This is really infectious. Everybody's like this. And that night, as I was watching someone, uh, there was a guest speaker, Jeanette Bankovich, uh, talking. And <clears throat> I, had, I looked around the room, and I just had this image in my head that I felt like I was on this cold, dark, snowy mountain. And, and I was freezing, and I walked up, and there's this beautiful log cabin, and the lights are on inside, and everybody inside is warm and friendly and laughing and by the fire. And I'm out in the cold. And I just, for the first time, really, uh, a real prayer. I looked up the Lord, and it's like, all right, you're up there. Part of being on the outside, I want to come in. And wow. I didn't know at the time, but within minutes after that, my life started to change. And two more times that week, I'm not going to take you through that, but two more times that week, I asked for things on the front page of the New York Times. Two more times, I got them. <laughs> we met the owners of the radio station. My wife wound up uh, having a show on the radio station. Uh, and they told me about this organization called Legatus, uh, which I'll come back to. And I got curious, and I was like, wow, maybe he is up there, you know? And so I just started diving in. I had a million questions as an atheist. Why? Not just what we believe, I sort of knew like Catholic faith, I guess, but why, why, you know, why Jesus? Uh, why the robes? Why mass? Why, what's with all the rules? You know, I just had all the questions that you would have. And what I found as I looked into it, is our faith, and really it's all, all Christian faiths, you know, there's, a, there's an incredible uh, beauty to it and logic to it. It's not an irrational thing. It's very well, I don't say thought out, but it's very, it's very complete. There's no loose ends. If you want to dig in, if you want to study it, like I had learned how to study crankshafts and, and blockchain, if you spend the time, it's a beautiful theology, a beautiful, rich fabric of theology. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's come on, uh, obviously, it changed my life. And I'm not going to take you through my whole deacon journey, but uh, two years after that night, I was applying for uh, entry into the seminary to become a deacon. Now, if you're not familiar with permanent deacons, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a, you know, I'm ordained clergy, I wear a collar. Uh, it's six years in the seminary, nights and weekends, test homework papers, just like, <laughs> like you all. And uh, we can, uh, you know, baptize, uh, marry, and bury. So we call it hatch, match, and dispatch. Uh, we, can, uh, we can assist the priest at Mass, we can uh, help them, uh, we can't consecrate, uh, but we can assist, and we can preach. So I preach uh, two weeks a month. And it's been a beautiful, beautiful ministry for me. Uh, it has some great side benefits. I've baptized all six of my grandchildren. I married my son to his wife, and so it's a lot, those are the perks of the job, because the pay isn't so good, zero. 
<laughs> but uh, it's, it's been a beautiful journey for me. And of course, the deacons uh, aren't like a priest. I mean, we've been married. We have, you know, uh, wives and kids and mortgages and Shelby GT 350. Uh, but I don't want so much, you know, so why, is, why am I telling you all that? Because I wanted to give you some sense of, you know, that you can find out more by exploring things you didn't, uh, didn't think were important. So I want to talk about, you know, the value of faith in your life and the value of the faith of your faith in the business world. Because they're, they're both interesting. And, uh, you know, then we'll, we'll wrap that up with that. But um, I'd say from, the, from a personal standpoint, I'd ask you to, you know, consider uh, the possibility of God. And maybe you already are at, very active in your faith, um, and that's wonderful. But I'm guessing a lot of you are, yeah, yeah, maybe he's up there. He's, he's, you know, I see him once in a while. I can feel him once in a while, but not really important to my life. I'm too busy right now. It doesn't matter what faith denomination you are. I have people listening today. I have Hindus, Hindus Muslims, uh, Jews, Christians, atheists, all listening in here. It doesn't matter. God is God. God is not one religion. God is God. But I would ask you, you know, to consider the possibility of God, because when you consider the possibility of God, the reality of God kind of rushes in and fulfills and fills you up. It's not just something, uh, you know, theoretical. It's something so fundamental to our lives that we just don't take the time to, to research it and to think about it, just like cars. We don't really think about how significant all that technology is. And yet it's so important to get from A to B. Well, same with God. It's so significant to your life, and yet we, we can't take it for granted. But God created us out of love. He loves each of us, each one of us. Not in a generic sense. Yeah, God loves us. Okay. No, he loves you, and you, and you, and you, and all of us individually. He knows the number of hairs on your head. That was the one my daughter got, got to her when she really um, pondered the fact that God knows me that well. Right? And he loves you. He wants you with him in heaven someday. I remember the first time I felt his love. We don't have time for that, but I, you know, I, I, the first time that I felt his love, it, it was overwhelming. I thought, wow, I had no idea. You have time for me, Lord? Don't you have better things to worry about <laughs> than me? And yet I could feel his, his presence his, my, in, my, in my heart. Um, and my life was never, you know, never the same. I invite you on a personal level, explore him, seek him out. Feel his love, understand what that love means for you uh, and how it, to live your life. And it will change the way you live your life. It will change the way you, know, you interact with everyone. It will change your family. And my fortune, you know, my, I have a beautiful family of, of, of children and grandchildren that are all filled with faith, they all go to mass regularly, they all get their sacraments and so on. Um, so it has a ripple effect uh, on your faith and your faith experience. But because this is a business class, so let's talk about why is faith important in your business life? Because I used to think, my dad being the atheist, you know, um, that faith is over here, business is over here. You know, that, that all right, yeah, you can go to church whatever you want to do on Sundays. But well, come Monday morning, man, you suit up. You suit up, you put your armor on, and you go and you fight. You go fight for your, for your family, for your job, for your career, um, and, you know, all kinds of bare-knuckle politics in the office just to get ahead and things like that. And so I, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And, and as I mentioned before, the radio station folks introduced me to an organization called Legatus, which is an organization of Catholic CEOs. And <clears throat> as soon as I heard that, I was like, I got to join that group because I have no idea how to be Catholic in the workplace. And this is after I came into my faith. How do I, I don't know the rules. How can you do that? How can you be, you know, um, caring and, and compassionate and treating everybody with dignity and respect and the image and likeness of God and uh, do it with honesty and integrity. Well, it turns out that's actually good business. You know, it's not just a, an ethos of personal responsibility. It's good business. Now, Dr. Bell talked about, you know, our growth of 1,300%. Not because I'm a good businessman. It, it's because customers Appreciate. They like to be treated with dignity and respect. They like to be told the truth. They like to know that they're going to get a fair deal. And when you approach them that way, they respond. Right? And, and not to say we never had problems. We've always had problems. And a software business is a, is a technologically complex business. There's always mistakes. There's always problems. But we own up to them. And if we make a mistake, we make it good. 
And we are 100% referenceable. I mean, every customer we've ever had in our 23 year history would be referenced for us. Again, that's not necessarily a testimony to our competency, although I think uh, I would like to brag that it is, but it's more, it's, it's the founders are Catholic as well as I am, but it's not even a question of which faith, it's the fact that we put faith as the center and the core of our business. It's who we are, it drives every decision we make. And it's not incompatible, it's actually, there are some tough decisions, I will, I will grant you. There are times when we could have taken a quick buck, but it would have compromised our, our uh, you know, our ethics were compromised, uh, our focus, and we said, no, I'm not doing that. And, you know, at, at, at a short, you know, you could take a hit in revenues even. But it always came back. It always came back to be the right thing in the long term. It always came back that the customers saw that we were serious, that we, you know, we walked away from different things, and then they remembered that, and they would come back and say, well, you said no over here, so that means there's some things you won't do. So when you say you will do something, that means you're going to, you know, you're probably good at it, and you actually do it. So, um, it's good business. I would say also in, in, in interactions, your, your customers and your colleagues are hungry for faith. I was surprised that when I came into my faith, you know, I kept, I don't, I don't go around talking about faith. I still had this notion that, you know, faith is over here. It's not something you typically talk about in the workplace. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, I will give one example, a colleague, uh, I mean, a customer, I had a great meeting with him. Talked a couple hours, and then we were shaking hands, saying goodbye, and uh, he said, Rich, uh, next time, I'd like to talk to you about the Catholic Church. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like, I didn't mention it at all. But he had seen it on my LinkedIn profile that I was a deacon. He goes, I have a lot of questions about the Catholic Church. I'm thinking of entering, and, and can you talk about it? I said, sure. <laughs> and so we had a great conversation. He's been a repeat customer for years now, but partly because of that. I've had colleagues... You know, we working, I had some fallen away uh, uh, Christians and Catholics you know, that we work in, they're like, wait a minute, uh, time out. Can we take a God break? I got some questions. And then we just like launch into a whole bunch of, uh, you know, questions about the faith. But they're hungry, they're hungry for that faith. Um, so I would just say, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's also the best way to sleep better at night. I mean, I like sleeping at night. <clears throat> I'm not a good liar. I'm not a good game player. I just want to do good work, right? And if you live your life like that, you sleep a heck of a lot better. You spend less time in the confessional. <laughs> and you live a, a more fulfilled life. Your customers recognize that and your business grows. So I guess I'm going to wrap up and just say, in summary, you know, take a look. Take a look at God. Take a real, you know, he's knocking on the door all the time. He's waiting for you to open it. You know, I open it when I said I want to come in. But whatever way you want to well, welcome him in. But don't dismiss him as a just that crazy thing that your grandparents believe in. Don't dismiss them as, a, you know, something irrelevant like a crankshaft that you don't really care about. Just turn the key on and off you go. Don't dismiss them like blockchain that's too complicated to really get to know what does, has value. Go and check them out for yourself. I always say uh, if for, for the Catholics in the room, you know, go to catholic.com if you have a question. It's an easy one to remember, right? But it has all kinds of great faith questions and answers for you. There's lots of videos and books. We, you know, there's lots of ways you can go find out for yourself. And you will be fascinated and amazed by what you find. It's the most essential and useful thing you will ever study in this university. It'll give you a sense of peace. Like my wife had and I had. I never knew. It'll fill you up. It'll fill up that hole in you that we all have. It's, a, it's an infinite hole in our heart. And St. Augustine says, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That hole, an infinite hole, can only be filled by an infinite being. And when you fill it up, we all try to fill it up with other things, right? You fill it up with money or power, fame or Shelby's or, uh, or uh, sex or drugs, whatever it is. It doesn't have a place. You can't fill that hole. Only God can fill that hole. And when you look at him, when you feel that hole, turn to him. Seek him out. He will make you better. He will make you better in your personal life. He will make you better business people. I guarantee that. And he will help you in this life and help you get into the next one. Well, that'll stop, I think. So, question I think is next, right? Yes, I think uh, you want to come down, is that, does he need to come down here? Yeah. If you'll come down. Um, Just so we can get it on the air with everybody. Yes, sir, uh, Matthew McFarlane. Um, how do you see uh, institutions that currently um, 
How do you see institutions developing along with the world? <laughs> um, with, uh, you, know, you know, trustless systems and, uh, you know, like in the blockchain right. scenario, yeah, yeah. How do you see institutions that currently uh, facilitate these transactions adapting to these uh, applications built upon the blockchain? Like, you know, like a bank. Yeah. How does a bank transform when you don't, when you have an application for a bank? Where does the profit go? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, it is. It's early days. I didn't mention that before. Is that you know, like the internet, you know, from like the '90s, early '90s. It took a while for it to develop. Everybody could see the potential of it, but it took a while for people to actually change their business model. It's even still happening today, right? The internet really took off in you know, 93, 94. We're still living through the ripple effects of that now to go to this digital transformation. So it's taken that long, but there have been some fundamental you know, transitions, right? You know, the music industry, you'll remember Napster and all this kind of stuff and the peer-to-peer you know, -peer sharing. It destroyed the old model for music. The music industry is about a fifth the size of what it used to be uh, because technology just gutted it, right? Um, that could happen and probably will happen to some industries with blockchain. Blockchain is in its early days, just like the internet. It will take many years for it to have its full ripple effects, but it has the potential to do away with many of those industries, uh, uh, you know, like title insurance, like uh, banks offering letters of credit between different uh, countries. You know, you don't know the other party and you both agree in a middle party and he collects money and transfers it back and forth. That could potentially go away. At the same time, though, banks are not stupid and everyone is, you know, the banks are the first ones recognizing some of this technology. They see it in some instances in the capital markets as a way to substantially reduce their cost. So, you know, when you, when a quick point, like if you buy, if I wanted to sell you 100 shares of IBM stock, there are like eight counterparties behind the scenes. I can't just give you the shares. Your brokers have to talk to your custodians, have to talk to your clearing agents and, and settlement agents. There's all these counterparts that all have to agree that I sold you 100 shares of IBM for this price on this date. And if there's any errors along the way, it all has to be reconciled and, and, and then fixed. Well, blockchain theoretically could take all that away because there's only be one record of the truth and you wouldn't need all that reconciliation. So in some ways, the industries will be served and other ways, the industries will be, will be disrupted. And that remains to be seen. So you're right, there will be some changes. Yeah. <laughs> I was so clear and so convincing that you don't have any questions. Yeah, doctor. <laughs> yeah, get up there. We go by the by the microphone, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> about your conversion and applicability to business, were there any practices that you suddenly became more attuned to and say, I can see why we do that or we really shouldn't do that? Like anything that really stood out? Um, well, you know, the, the most I'd said, the most significant thing is, is, um, is just being more honest. Uh, in, in your business dealings. So lots of times, especially in my business, um, we, you know, we're not a software company. We don't make software for sale ourselves. We help other software companies make this software, right? So, um, there, and there are lots, there are tens of thousands of companies like mine that do that same thing. And invariably, a lot of them um, sort of make stuff up. They'll pretend they're good at something. Well, we're really good at this. And they get the business and, and then they turn on, what, what, what's that technology? Blockchain, what? And they've got to scramble to figure it out and they screw it up and the customer loses and they lose uh, because they made a promise on something they didn't really understand. That doesn't mean you can't take some risks, but, but, um, uh, but being honest with the customer and saying, no, nah, we, we don't do that technology. We don't know that stuff. Um, and, and when you do that, the customer is almost shocked. What do you mean you don't do that? You know, what do you mean? Uh, you know, and they're like almost uh, like you're jilting them, you know, because you know, normally everyone just, yeah, I'll do whatever you say, whatever you say, just give me the money. Uh, and to, when you say no, it actually is a way to build trust. Because when you say no, I, I don't do this. I'm not the right company for this. We don't do this. Then later on, as I just said earlier, when you do say yes, it means yes. He says, oh, well, because you know, he said no here. When he says yes, he must mean yes. So we... I always say the biggest factor to our success and growth is saying no. 
uh, saying no to business that didn't fit our model. And that was the other thing is just, you have a focus that we do, we build commercial software, we help build software products. We don't do systems integration work. You know, we said no to a bunch of categories of work to help us focus, but we didn't lie about it and it just stopped the games. Not that we ever had them in this company, but in my prior life we had other companies, you know, there might be some gamesmanship with my play. And we just got rid of all that. That's one example, anyway. Oh, that's another one, okay. Um, I'm sure, sorry, my name What's your name? Mark. 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 Um, I'm sure as a CEO, you have a very busy life and with grandchildren and children, everything <laughs> is very busy. How in life do you find time every day to love God and to let God love you? And how does that present itself in ways that I should have been Good, good. Um, it's, it's sort of an oxymoron, but I mean, the more time you spend with God, the more time he gives you for everything else. Uh, we're not really short on time. It's, it, I spend some extra time in prayer and something like my day is a lot more ordered and less stressful, even though nothing got off my plate. But somehow, by putting him first and starting with him, the rest of it falls into place. If I try to do everything else first and whatever time I have left, I'll sneak God in, it's not a good day. I start with God. Unfortunately, I have to say, it's one of the, in the wisdom, uh, you know, priests that, you know, have to pray five times a day to have the breviary. Uh, the deacons have to pray, pray twice a day. And it's required of us. And thank God they did that. Because I'm sure I'd have a million excuses why I can't, I don't have time to pray. Uh, and yet, every time I do, I open the book and say, oh yeah, okay. Let me start with God. Let me end with God at the end of the day. And so, yeah, it, it, you, our lives are busy, of course, uh, you know, between travel and, and the kids and the grandkids. Um, and that's a different, there's also just some, I think that's the other thing about faith is it gives you a sense of perspective that the most important thing in life isn't business. It is, I'm sorry guys, as important as it is for us right now, is not the most important thing. Nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I'd spend more time at the office. It's not the most important thing you do. And so, God gives you that sense of balance and says, okay, you got to, of course, you got to work, you got to take care of your family, you got to put bread on the table, um, but it can't be the end all. And he gives you that balance to say, okay, I'm going to spend appropriate time at work, and now it's family time, and now it's, you know, it's prayer time. And it just, it's a, it's a rigor to it, I guess, but, but by starting and ending the day with him in prayer, it makes it a lot easier, at least for me. Okay? We have a question from online. Sure. Has your change of faith affected the way you think? Are you still very logical? And if so, has that affected the way you conduct business besides incorporating a Catholic morality? Uh, well, you know, one thing I would say is, so at one level, I feel I'm completely different on the inside than what I was 20 years ago, whatever, when I started this thing. And yet most people would look at me and say, it's pretty much the same. You know, yeah, you're still the same guy. You're still kind of logical. You're still uh, friendly. Um, so, God changes you in the most important ways, but, but you are who you are. He doesn't make us all as robots. We each are all given unique gifts, right? Um, none of us have the same gifts, but we're called to use those gifts in, in his service. And so you, you don't become somebody different. I think that was one thing I, I remember, you know, as I started growing closer, I took, you know, when I started learning about God, I was like, wow, this is, this is a little scary. I, you know, I don't know if I want to get that close to God. You know, it's God's over there, over here, I'm good. You know, how are you doing? I'm good. And he was always like, come here, come here, take a step. And I take the step, and I'm like, wow, this is so much better. But I'm good here. I'm good here. You're there. I'm here. It's good. And he's like, no, no, come here. Take the next step. And so that, you know, that trust that you have in God and the, the you know, the, my life is very different, obviously, now as a deacon than it was. And yet I'm still sort of the same guy, but I'm very much changed inside. I'm very much closer now. And that does drive my business decisions. Uh, you know, my, my, the morality is, is uh, it's not something I just do. It's, it's just it's central to my life now. It's not just I'm going to bolt on to morality here when I get, you know, when I get in trouble. Like, no, it, it's just it bakes into every decision. Every decision is how do I, uh, in, you know, increase the kingdom of God on earth? How do I treat my vocation, my business as a vocation? How do I serve? We have 1,200 employees. 
Um, how do I make sure that they stay employed and that they take care of their families and they grow in their careers? Um, those are all decisions. They're not so much, you know, uh, moral decisions, but but they're they're driven by the morality that takes sort of central central place because morality is not like something you wear. It's just something God calls you to. Right? God God says, "I love you." And then when you really understand what that love means, then you want to love them back. How do you love them back? We love them back by trying to be what he modeled for us, right? And for, for the Christians in the group, is for, for modeling what, the way Jesus lived his life. And he's calling us to model him more perfectly. And we never do. We, we always fail. We're all sinners. Um, but he's calling us toward that, that, uh, that morality. And, and anyway, uh, along with the answer to your question there. Any others? One more, there's one more. Cool. Um, Your name? Nicole. Nicole. So um, what would you say was the biggest challenge incorporating um, faith into business? The biggest challenge? Uh, well, I guess, you know, coming to grips with the, the notion that, that it was not incompatible to be a person of faith and to be a business leader. I always thought they were incompatible. And it took me a while. It took me several years that the, because I didn't think my dad obviously was not a role model for me as, a, as, a, as an atheist. And he was a good man, but not, uh, you know, didn't have a faith to drive him. So I didn't see what faith looked like in the business world with him. So I had to see it for myself. So I had to, by joining this group Legatus for Catholic CEOs, I got to meet men and women that, that had that and asked them lots of questions. So that was probably the hardest for me to see that. Really, I can, I can actually, you know, it actually is good business to be faithful and moral in, in how you do business. I, I, that one took me a while to digest. That answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was another one there or was that? Okay. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, I, I'm helping you back from dinner. Hopefully uh, you, uh, you get a chance to eat. I know you've been here all day. I can't believe you've been in the same room all day. That's That's... That's real endurance. That's a good testimony to your future potential as business leaders, that you, endurance is definitely part of the game. So uh, I hope you all uh, have a good evening, and thank you again for coming.